Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, I want to welcome all of you here today. And um, this is one of the monthly Lunch and Learn sessions that we do here um, in the Union. We're glad today that uh, we have with us Dr. Helena LaRush, who has done a lot of work and is continuing to do work in the Des Moines community. Um, she's currently an assistant professor in the College of Medicine in Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Iowa and um, got her undergraduate degree at Brown University in sociology. She earned a medical degree at the University of Missouri Columbia. She completed her residency in medicine and pediatrics at the University of Rochester, and she did a research fellowship with Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program at the University of Michigan. Her work um, focuses on diabetes and obesity prevention, with particular emphasis on families. And um, she's worked on, on a variety of projects, looking at parents' diets as they have children, to see if that makes a difference to have children in the house. Um, and that particular project that she did, she wrote a, a wonderful article that was published in uh, the journal that I now edit, and it got front, front page press, so it was very nicely done. Understanding what happens to children's diets in home when a parent is diagnosed with diabetes is another area she's worked in. Um, and she's done a lot of work with schools. One of her projects involved concession stands. Many times when you go to football games or other kinds of, of sports activities, the concession stand probably doesn't have the most healthy food. And so her goal was to change that. And she did a wonderful job in the Muscatine schools. She is currently testing a program to help families improve their diet and exercise with support from community organizations and the goal of preventing obesity. So please join me today in welcoming Dr. Helena LaRush. Thank you for that nice introduction, Linda. Um, so today we're going to talk about university and community partnerships um, for obesity prevention research. And um, we'll go through a couple things. We're just going to talk a couple basics about obesity. Then we'll talk about what community-engaged research is. And then I want to tell you a little bit about, first, our pilot project with my community partners, and then the larger um, trial that resulted from the um, smaller project. So this is the most current map from the CDC of obesity by state. Um, you can see that we're right here um, in, the, in the orange, at 30 to 35 percent, but we've now got states that are over 35 percent. And here's the same map for non-Hispanic black adults. Um, the reasons are multifactorial, but the disparities are evident. So 30.9% of U.S. adults meet the criteria for obesity, and that's a BMI over 30. So that's your uh, weight over your height squared. Um, and then in Iowa, it's 30.9%. Um, Non-Hispanic blacks in Iowa are 40%, and, and people who self-identify as Hispanic are 35.5%. Um, of note, 58% uh, of U.S. black women qualify. So low-income women do have a higher rate of obesity than higher-income women. That is not true in men. Um, uh, but obesity is tr present among all income levels. And in fact, if you look at just total numbers, there are more people who meet that criteria um, who are above those poverty lines than below. But the people who are below the, the poverty lines who are low income, they are the ones who, are, who don't have the resources available to them to try and make changes. Um, so obesity also hits our children, 17% of children aged 2 to 19 and 27% of low-income children aged 10 to 17. So we um, target high-risk families. So children are 2.5 times more likely to be obese if their father's obese and 4.2 times more likely to be obese if their mother is obese. Why? Well, it could be genetics. It runs in the family. It could be environment you know, what's around you, but the fact of the matter is that it's really both. So if you have two people here, they look the same, and this one with this plus sign here 
has what I would call a thrifty gene. In other words, they are able to use calories really efficiently and store them as fat. And in a time of famine, this would be a great gene to have. Okay. In our current environment, we would consider that a gene that puts you at risk for obesity. Keep them in a nice, healthy environment. You can see that these two people look just the same. Put them in our environment, and this is what happens. Um, the ones with the obesity genes um, gain weight, gain more weight than the others, even if they're doing some of the same behaviors. So obesity is complex. Nutrition and physical activity are complex. Um, and this big slide is just to kind of show you how complex this is. So you've got parents in the middle. They're trying to model things. They're trying to provide things for their children. They're trying to shape their children's activity. But around them are all these other things, um, you know, policies like what, what happens in school PE and what are the kids getting fed for lunch at school, okay? What, the advertising that's going straight to their children. Um, you know, what's their community characteristics like? Is their neighborhood walkable? Is, their, is the crime level too high for them to let their children out to play? Do they have access to healthy foods and recreational spaces? In terms of organizational characteristics, what are their job characteristics like? Are they working the night shift? Are they home at the same time that their children are? Um, so all of these things, along with child characteristics, parent characteristics, and even family characteristics, all these things together are shaping what's happening in that home. So now I'm going to stop focusing on obesity because what I want you to focus on is good nutrition, physical activity, good sleep, and healthy families because that's what we really want to focus on, not, not the weight. Okay? So a happy family. And this happens to be my son. <laughs> and yes, that's a lemon. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm going to switch gears for a second and talk to you about community-engaged research. So this is the NIH term for, for some of what I do. And it involves a collaboration between academic institutions and communities. Um, and for them, it can be improving health regardless of specific types or degrees of engagement. So it might be a little bit of engagement together, or it might be all working together all the time. Um, Community-based participatory research is a type of this community-engaged research where academics and community partners work together from the beginning to the end and all stages of the research and really work hand in hand. Um, there are other types. You'll see a lot of different names for these different things. Community participatory um, partnered research and the difference between that and community-based participatory research is that it allows for the fact that in community-based participatory research they really try and push for the ideas to come from the community. In this type of research it allows that that the idea might come from the academic side even if together they decide it's a good idea and move forward. It just allows for a little more flexibility on that part. Okay. So here we have traditional research at the top and community-based participatory research at the bottom. So traditional research is what we've always done, right? We, we come up with an idea, we figure out how we're going to research it, we figure out our intervention, we find our population and we go in and we study them and we take that research and do something with it. We write it up, we put it in a journal, we, we move forward with that. But it's all controlled by the researchers. Okay? In the middle is, is, is something like um, community partners might help us with research, re recruitment. You might do focus groups at the beginning of your research and get some ideas from the community and then kind of take hold from there. So there's a lot of varying levels in the middle of, of, of how um, academic and community partners work together. And then at the bottom is community-based participatory research where the ideas are together working on all parts. So community-based participatory research, the idea is that it facilitates a collaborative, equitable partnership in all phases of the research that everybody's involved in everything. That's the goal, right? So it fosters a co-learning and capacity building among partners. So the idea is that the people in the university learn a lot about how the community works, learn how to present things to the community, learn all sorts of things, and that the community partners should learn something as well, whether it's presentation skills, how to write grants, learning about how to deal with data, that they should come out away with some skills as well and that it should focus on the local relevance of public health pro 
problems and on the ecological perspective. So it should work on things that matter to the community and it should think about all those levels that were on those slides. And then we disseminate the results to our partners and involve them in the wider dissemination of results. So it doesn't just go in a journal, it gets presented back to the community, it presented back to our community partners, maybe they will use that data to ask for a grant for themselves. Um, you know, what are we going to do with that data and where is it going to go? Um, and then it's, it's a long-term process and a commitment to sustainability. So ideally, the goal is to keep working together and not just to do one project and have it kind of end. Um, so that's the goals. Um, you know, this is the ideal and this is what we strive for. Often we end up somewhere in the middle. So why do this sort of research? It makes it more relevant and innovative if um, um, you have people who are in the community, they have all sorts of ideas that we might not come up with here in the academic ivory tower. Okay. And it gives communities and populations a voice in the research that affects them. Um, for a long time, communities were the subjects of research, but they didn't really have a voice in the research. And we've learned that research done in controlled randomized trials and academic research centers, okay, doesn't always translate well to the real world. So it works really well here when we do it in a very controlled environment, and then we take it from like the university hospital and we take it to the community health center, and it doesn't work quite so well because the setting's different, it's, and so we need to learn how to translate that. And so the National Institute of Health, which is one of our big funders here, um, they're starting to prioritize translational research as a way to help reduce health disparities. So translational research, you know, we, we think about it as bench to bedside, so, you know, the things from the lab to the, to the, the clinical patients, but then the next step from that is, is also um, clinical trials, things we do in the academic controlled setting, how we take those out into the community. That's the next step of translation is how do we get it out into the community and figure out a way to make it work there. And then came the Affordable Care Act. Um, you know, we all think about it as the insurance part, but there were other parts to this act. And one of the things it was aiming at was to eliminate disparities and to reduce costs. And one of the parts of doing that was a focus on community engagement. Um, and the reasons behind that were the idea was that they were going to align academic health center agendas with community priorities. They were going to enhance public trust. There is, in a lot of communities, an inherent now distrust of researchers. And there's a reason for that. Um, there are past histories of, of things that were done that, that weren't ethical, that were um, done to communities, done to participants, um, that, that weren't good things to do. And think about Tuskegee. So that history is still with us. And so part of what we try to, trying to do as we engage communities is to rebuild that trust, give them a reason to trust us again. And again, we're trying to build that bi-directional capacity and empowerment on both sides. And under the Affordable Care Act, we got PCORI, Patient Centered Outcome Research Institute. It's separate from National Institutes of Health. It um, funds um, separate things, but it requires a lot of things that NIH doesn't. So they have patients on the review panels who help review grants. If you do a grant for them, you have to have patients involved in your research project to different extents. So they, and they want research that looks at outcomes that patients care about, things like quality of life. Okay. So they're asking for this type of research, at least, in, at least regarding patients. Okay. Oops. And so why do we do this from the university standpoint? It gives us on the ground insight. It helps us with recruitment. It gives us relevance to the real world and not our ivory tower view, right? It gives us an understanding of the community of those and those who live there, and it builds equity and trust. And why do community partners do this? Um, well, for some of them, it fits with their mission to help the community. They see it as a way to, to enhance what they're doing. Um, it helps them test strategies that they want to they work with. They want to know if they work. Sometimes we're helping evaluate those. It gives them a chance to participate in research, and it gives them a chance to drive the research to test what's meaningful to them. 
It also brings jobs and enhancement opportunities to community members, and it can bring resources to the community. So I asked one of my community partners, well, why, why are you doing this with us? Why do you care? <laughs> what? Um, and she used to, she was working at DMAC at the time, and she said, well, DMAC's well known for workforce training programs and research. That's what they do. And, and it's Des Moines Area Community College. So they do workforce training in Des Moines. And over 5,000 individuals come through their center annually getting, to get workforce training and employment placement support. But she says that obesity and chronic illness are prevalent factors among program participants, that it's part of the things that these participants are having to deal with, or these people coming in are having to deal with. And that what she sees is that many employers view obesity-related diseases as preventable lifestyle choices. And what happens is this increases the risk of employment discrimination against individuals um, who have higher BMIs. And furthermore, there aren't any federal laws protecting employees from discrimination based on obesity or weight. Um, only one state, Michigan, and a handful of local governments. So she sees programs that help with nutrition and physical activity and chronic illness and, and obesity as something that are very relevant to what she's trying to do in terms of bringing people into, work, into the workforce because it is relevant to their job search, in fact. So she sees that they go hand in hand. And it fits with the current research that they're trying to do. They're trying to take low income people and people with low education and find ways to get them trained to get them into the workforce. How do we help them to where they want to go? And that they want to minimize high risk factors and obesity is one of them. So this is my goal. I'm going to put myself out of business. Someday, <laughs> not quite yet. So this is our project. This, is our this was our first intervention project. We did some interview projects before that, but this was our first intervention project. And these are some of my community partners. So in our first project, we had the visiting nurse services. Um, they also do parenting programs, if you didn't know. And actually, our first health coach was a visiting nurse, um, the YMCA. Um, the Des Moines Area Community College, um, who we still work with. A DMARC, the Des Moines Area Religious Council. They're the people who supply um, food to all the food pantries throughout Des Moines. They're one of the people who do that. Um, I was to social and economic development. At the time, they were doing screenings for individuals. You know, do you need heating, do you need housing, things like that. They were doing those sorts of screenings, so we linked with them um, so that they could help us with that. And Iowa State University, their extension, yes, we can work with Iowa State. Um, <laughs> they do um, all sorts of nutrition and activity classes, and they have all sorts of resources. They're really good at that. So we don't need to reinvent that. And Primary Health Care, which is the community health centers in Des Moines. They have a couple locations, and they do everything from providing health care to providing dentistry care to providing social work to AIDS care. They, have, they even have a, a place to get clothes. So they do a little bit of everything. And they were the first person that I started partnering with and then it blossomed that way. And these are some of our kids getting bikes and bike helmets. So the original pilot was developed working together between our community partners and academic partners, sitting around a table going, OK, how do we make this work? We want to get them community resources, but we want to help them know how to use them. We want to motivate them to get them. How can we put things together? How can we make something work together? And, and that's when things work together. On the academic side, we had this great basis in motivational interviewing, this great, a lot of people who'd done it and, and, and a good, solid foundation. On their side, they really knew how to put things together and how to connect people with resources. And we said, well, how, maybe we can put those two things together and make something that works. So this was our first project. And in the first project, we had families where one adult met the criteria for obesity was, or was glucose intolerant or had diabetes, and often all three, or two or three. And they had to have a child living in the home who was under 18. Um, and they were recruited from the community health centers and the food pantries, because we were aiming for low-income families. 
And in our pilot, they had to be English speaking because this was our first try at this. And what we did was we combined motivational interviewing targeting family diet and physical activity change, not individuals, we were really targeting family goals. And we combined that with community resource mobilization, connecting them with community resources that were related to the goals that they wanted to do and related to some of the basics that had to get taken care of before they could even think about diet and exercise. And because we had a group of um, community people working with us, plus another, other people who weren't even on that list providing services, we were able to use that network to kind of make things coordinate better. We were able to coordinate with our community partners to get resources. Oops. So what is motivational interviewing? Um, it's a counseling approach, and you think about health coaching, but it's a little different. It's a different approach. Um, to that and what it really does is try and support motivation for change. So it's really focusing on what motivates you to want to change and it supports self-efficacy in terms of now do you believe that you can make these changes and it focus the participants choose the goals and priorities relevant to their values. So we ideally would love them to get more physical activity. That's what we want. Um, but it doesn't, we might say, well that's great for your health. That's why you want to do it. Well, maybe their motivation to go walk to work instead of take their car is environmental. Or maybe it's they're going to save gas. Okay? The, the motivation might be different. The result is the same. So we want them to pick things, that reasons that motivate them and choices that matter to them. And then they're going to have much more motivation to actually do these things. So our goal was to combine this motivational interviewing with community resources to help them achieve their goals. Um, so the first thing we did was try and address other needs that allow families to even work on diet and activity. So things like heating and housing. Um, you know, if you're about to lose your apartment tomorrow, diet and activity are just not on the top of your priority list. So until we can deal with some of these things with some of these low-income families, we can't even get to that to that um, topic. Um, and then we use the resources to make goals more achievable. So once they have um, some goals, are there resources in the community that we can connect them with that would help them make those goals more achievable? And then on the other hand, we hope that mo using motivational interview viewing will motivate families to take advantage of the resources because we've handed out resource you know, pamphlets before, but you got to have a motivation to really follow up and want to do those, use those resources. Um, and then we, by focusing on the family and not on the individual, we hope that individuals within the family will provide mutual support to one another. So our first um, version had four health coach visits, five follow-up phone calls. Um, we had a session with a resource screener who would go through a whole list of community resources and see what was needed by the family. And then the health coaches would help them select resources according to need when it came to diet and ex activity. Our first group, we, had, we started out with 45 families. They were about a third African American, a third um, self-identified as Latino, and a third um, were Caucasian. About 80% of our families answered at least one question positively when we did a food insecurity scale. Um, about 80% of our targeted adults turned out to be female. They had an average BMI of 39. Remember the cutoff for obesity is 30. Um, and the average age of the children were about nine um, and the average number of children was two, but we had anywhere from one to nine kids in these homes. About 38 of them made it to their first health coach visit. That's pretty par for the course. Um, and we had a data on 29 at six months. We made an average of uh, four referrals and an average of two to our um, core community partners. And we were able to verify that about two were acted upon. We also gave them two servings of fruits and vegetables per person per day for two months and then monthly through the um, food bank. Um, and then um, as needed, they, they were given recipes, family physical activity ideas, parks and rec activity information. They all got cookbooks and pedometers and were taught how to use them. And then we referred them out to community resources for a variety of things 
anywhere from the nutrition and physical activity classes for ISU Extension. A lot of them did that and enjoyed that. Um, GED programs, free school supplies, YMCA memberships, refurbished bikes, um, heating, housing, um, health insurance, job placement, business clothes. You know, and some of these things you think about, well, how do those really link to diet and exercise? But what they did um, was kind of allow them to um, um, use their resources differently. So instead of having to use their resources for school supplies, one family who was doing wanted to do free, a new fruit and vegetable every, every week. That was their goal. They were working on it, trying to do new fruits and vegetables. And then when it came school time, they needed to pay for school supplies. And so there was a choice between school supplies and food. But it turns out that there are places in Des Moines that give out free school supplies for low-income families. So by pointing them to the free school supplies, now they have the school supplies and they can use the money for fruits and vegetables. So sometimes it's a matter of um, taking resources from here and applying them over here. So, so sometimes other things make a big difference, even if they're not directly related to diet and exercise. So our goal was to see nobody, th th we wanted their weight to hold. We didn't want them to gain weight. Um, and um, in our adults, um, they, on average, they didn't. Um, that's not statistically significant, but it's a negative 0.5 um, BMI um, change. For the, adult, for the kids, they had a negative 0.5% um, in their percentile of BMI. Um, again, not statistically significant with our smaller numbers, but holding steady. Um, we did have 12 adults among our group who had diabetes, and they significantly decreased their average glucose. That's what a hemoglobin A1C is. It's your average glucose for three months. And they significantly decreased that. In a very, that is very clinically significant, and it happens to be statistically significant. Um, and then this is the family nutrition and physical activity scale. And what it is is a bunch of questions about activities that we know are related to childhood obesity. Um, and so what we saw was a four point change in that, which was very statistically significant. And we use that scale because it has a lot of different activities on it. So that if one family chooses to make changes in the physical activity realm, where another family chooses to make more dietary changes, you can see changes on the scale in both of them. And so we were able to take that data from our, from our pilot and, ch and send it to the National Institute for Health. And they were kind enough to, uh, to fund us to try this out and really prove whether this intervention worked. You know, we knew people liked it. We knew people kind of were holding their weight. And we, pulled, and we showed that we could actually pull it off. But we, now we need to prove that it really works. Um, so you'll see these are a lot of the same community partners, OK? Um, um, in addition, we have the Evelyn K. Davis Center, which came into being as we were doing the pilot project. Um, they're really a great center because they bring together volunteers from all over Des Moines, um, all different organizations, and they, they are, they're connected to the Des Moines Area Religious um, Community College, and they're also uh, funded by the United Way. And what happens is volunteers from each of these different organizations come to this site, and they're there to help families kind of navigate the system, um, help connect them with different resources. Um, and each, each organization takes turns um, being there. They volunteer to do that. So there's like one paid employee. <laughs> so this is a five-year grant funded by the NIH um, from the National Heart and Lung and Blood Institute. Um, it's community engaged research. Um, this is our name, Living Well Together, or, or Viviendo Juntos y Sanos, because now we're doing it in both English and Spanish. So we have families where one adult um, meets the criteria for obesity. They have to have a child 6 to 12 in their home. Um, they can have lots of other children. Um, and they are recruited from different sites where we're aiming to get low-income families. So this is how we get our low-income families, by where we choose to recruit. Um, it's the community health center, the food pantries. Iowa Workforce Development is where people go to get their, um, uh, get their financial subsidies. They have to go to a class there first, um, and we recruit at the class. We go to summer child feeding sites. The public health department has a clinic, and they are recruiting for us as well. And we have a bunch of other sites. 
Um, this is where you know my community partner said we weren't doing very well with just a couple sites, and they said, well, you should recruit over here. Or no, you should go over here. They knew much better than I did. They said, no, go these places. Um, and they've been right. Um, so, and in this time we did it in English and in Spanish. And it's this, you'll notice that it's the same intervention basically um, with improvements based on what we learned. Um, it's health coaching with motivational interviewing. It's family focused diet and physical activity goals. This time we have six health coach visits because we learned we needed a few more. Uh, five follow-up phone calls, two sessions with our resource screener who goes through housing, heating, the whole thing like that, and then community resources ac according to need. This is a randomized control trial, so we are, our goal in the end is to get, aim for 260 families. 130 will get the whole thing. 130 will get an, an educational control. Um, so. You can, you can see here this, maybe you can see here. So these are the 130 um, families in our educational group. They get screened just like the other families with our screener for the housing and the heating and that. We do that with all of our families. Um, they also get um, uh, basically the week handbooklets that talk about diet and activity. They also get bi-monthly newsletters that give them more information on recipes and the activities they can do and things like that. Um, where the other group gets the full thing with the health coaches and everything else um, that's very similar to the um, pilot intervention. Um, and it includes some things like the fruits and vegetables and also the YMCA has given us um, free four-month memberships, um, trial memberships, and then we help them if they want to continue help them kind of navigate the process of how do you get lower fees for the YMCA because it is a process. Um, and, uh, and so then we follow them for 18 months. So every six months we come to their door, we weigh and measure them, we put activity monitors on their, their wrists and have them walk around, have them do their normal activities for a week. Um, and, um, and then we also do a large number of questionnaires. And then how do we work together? So how does this work in the, in the, in for this trial? So we, um, to, to, to meld with our community partners, on the NIH grant, we put um, some of our community partners on as co-investigators. So Barry Engelbretson from Primary Healthcare is a co-investigator. Marvin Jajir from um, Des Moines Area Community College and the Evelyn Davis Center for Working Families is also a co-investigator, taking over for Denise Ikerigi. Um and so I meet with them every week. Um, we subcontract with them and also with the Des Moines Area Religious Council through, through our grant. So we, we um, subcontract and give them a portion of the, the money to do their piece of the grant. Um, and then our, our, the screener who does the, the basic screening is actually a Des Moines Area Community College employee, not a university employee. We felt that she was better integrated there and could do what she needed to do better if she was integrated into the community college. Um, and like I said, we do weekly calls with my co-investigators and then we do quarterly meetings with our community partners. Um, we do give a stipend to our organizations for the time they spend coming to our meetings and answering our emails. It's probably still not enough. Um, uh, and um, we also, they help us with recruitment and everything else. So where are we? At last count, we had 43 families enrolled. Um, we, um, my lovely, <laughs> Helpers here, Shelby and Kristen are over here. They are analyzing the accelerometry data. We're just starting to, to think about looking at that. Um, we are analyzing our initial health coach visits and trying to continue to train our health coaches to make them better and better and to make sure that we're doing what we said we were doing. Um, and, and we're preparing to try and get a lot of the data into the um, computer system so we can start taking an initial look at our initial families. And that's where we are. And I, my thank you slide, they didn't all fit on one thank you slide. So we'll go for one thank you slide, we'll go to another thank you slide, and then they're going to be mad at me, but I put up pictures. <laughs> 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 so.
So I am open to questions of any sort. Mm -hmm. So our coaches are, um, they vary in their training. They are not healthcare professionals. Um, our coaches, um, wanna, um, both of them have uh, experience with low-income families. They have both worked with them in various capacities. One of them was a um, case manager for the schools. Another one um, has worked in multiple um, community organizations with low-income families. So we felt that, that that was actually more important than being a healthcare. We actually found that healthcare professionals are terrible motivational interviewing health coaches. <laughs> are for <laughs> it's, we're too strict. I, we, so, um, um, but then we took them and um, with Linda's help and her um, team we train them in motivational interviewing we also they did basic you know basic diet training basic physical activity training um, they um, they started out with um, um, they did a couple days of motivational interviewing training then we had them do practice interviews and then we've been taping all of their sessions so they then they go back and they go through their sessions with our with our our, our team that trains them in motivational interviewing and now even now when they're out in the field we're taping those sessions and so we go back through those sessions with them you know this this fet, this was motivational interviewing and this 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 met the spirit this you could have done a little differently so they just keep getting kind of better and better if there are questions that have to do with physical activity and nutrition because obviously we don't expect they're not experts um, they they refer them to we have you know two nutritionists on board we have uh, Kathy Jansen her whole team for physical activity so we have more resources for them if they need it um, they also have a lot of resources with them so so when families you know they're not sure what kind of goals they want to set what we have is we have a whole set of kind of materials to help them walk through to think about well are you interested in this or are you interested in that and what we do is we try and focus on um, really five things that, that have really good evidence behind them that the, our families do pick other things as well um, but if they don't know where they want to go or we want to steer them away from something that doesn't make any sense right um, we have focused on sugar sweetened beverages um, increased sleep um, decreased uh, media time decreased time in front of the screen increased physical activity and what am I missing? Oh, more fruits and vegetables. <laughs> or, you know, um, um, but it's all done in a way to kind of let them decide where they want to go with that. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, with regard to your random control trial, I know you have 23 families training, you're still gathering data, but do yeah. you have any outcome of, if did you get more families with the full service, or is it about even with just those kids, that, the families that just got the education? So you're asking me, are the outcomes the same in the people who did the two different things? So we aren't at that point to be able to say that. Um, they're all still going through the, through the intervention. Um, we're only six months in, and a lot, some of them have only been going for a month. Uh, so um, we, um, you know, they will be, they're randomized, so they end up being about half and half in each intervention, and it, you know, it's completely up to the computer. We push the computer, the, the button, the Excel file, and it tells us which group they're in, so it's completely random. Um, we do stratify by where they were, um, where they were recruited from, because there's some differences in those populations, so we do stratify by that, and we do stratify by self-identified race of the target adult, so that we're trying to make sure that we get be equal numbers in 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 both groups, but no results yet. So we'll have to have to wait. <laughs> so how many people do you hope to enroll in total? Do you have a like a minimum or a goal in mind? Mm -hmm. So how many? She's asking how many people did we would we like to enroll total? Um, the ultimate goal would be two hundred and sixty. We can we hope we can get there. Um, you know, recruitment of these populations is hard. We're working hard. Everybody's working hard. Um, but um, we're making progress. So, but we're recruiting over a two-year span. So we're not trying to get them all at once. In fact, we don't want them all at once. Uh, that would be a real strain on my community partners and everybody collecting data. So, um, 
Um, so we still have another year and a half of recruiting to go. Oh, from the pilot study. So he wants to know more about the physical activity diet uh, from the pilot study. So in the pilot, we didn't have the accelerometers the way we do for the randomized control trial. So we will have much um, better data uh, for the randomized control trial. Um, what we did see was one of the biggest changes that they were reporting was actually less screen time. That was the big thing that seemed to be um, seem to have resonated um, when we when uh, we looked at the um, survey data. That was one of the big changes was was decreased screen time rather than um, more physical activity time. Though we did have families doing things like biking together. That's where the pictures came from because we had uh, families who wanted to to bike together, and we were able to get some of them re refurbished bikes because there was a guy who made re refurbished bikes. So we were able to get them plus helmets, always with helmets. So, but the biggest change that we were seeing in the data that we had was really about less screen time. Do you know how much that, you know the hours you Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. Unfortunately, I'd be happy to send it to you. But I don't know if Yeah. It's all the Des Moines public school district because it's all that's a big school district. So they so they, um, and we do have we have a representative from the Des Moines pu uh, public schools who is part of our community partner group. She's been very helpful in in in, in helping uh, point us toward, towards resources that are available in the schools for these families, and and towards um, opportunities for recruitment as well. So, but it's all Des Moines public schools, yeah. So is Des Moines in the blue um, so, no, Des Moines is not Blue Zones. Iowa City is Blue Zones, but Des Moines is not. Oh, there is at least one area that it's Urbandale. Yeah, I think it might be Urbandale. So, w we, are, we are mainly, we do have some people from Urbandale. They're, they're, they are within the community. Um, a majority of our patients are, are people are, are from more the center of Des Moines. But we have them scattered all over. We have a few, we've expanded out. Grimes is available, so. We've got them kind of all over. Anything else? Okay. Okay. Helena, thank you so very much. Mm -hmm. um, You're welcome. Truly appreciate um, your talk today. Um, and, and your work, I think, is really incredible in terms of what we can do in communities where the need is so high. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. And um, our Lunch and Learn uh, will be Thursday, November 5th, and um, Nate Keating will be here talking about food and community. We did a lot of work with him when we were doing our theme semester, Food for Thought, and so he'll be here to talk about uh, some of the things he was involved with us in, in that particular project. Thank you so very much. Have a great afternoon.